Okay, so this is kind of where we left off our last lecture, Chemistry 111. This is Chapter 9, and we were talking about formal charges on Lewis structures, and I gave you a formula for calculating the formal charge on an atom. I said the formal charge was equal to the number of valence electrons, so valence electrons subtract the number of sticks, which is meaning bonds, and then subtract the number of dots, which is the number of um, electrons. So electrons, anyhow, and that gives you the formal charge. So for neutral molecules, a Lewis structure in which there are no formal charges is going to be preferable to one in which there are formal charges present. Okay, so we always want to go for the formal for the Lewis structure rather that has um, the the lower number of formal charges. The second one says Lewis structures with large formal charges are less plausible than those with small formal charges. So if we have charges like minus two or plus two or something like that, we generally try to avoid those kinds of things in Lewis structures. And then finally, the third one says among Lewis structures having similar distributions of formal charges, the most plausible structure is the one in which the negative formal charges are on the more electronegative atoms. So let's take a look at the example of formaldehyde. It says formaldehyde, CH2O, is a liquid with a disagreeable odor. Traditionally, it's been used to preserve laboratory specimens. Draw the most likely Lewis structure for the compound. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tally up the total number of valence electrons in CH2O. So let's see here for carbon. Carbon is in group 4A, so it's got a total of four valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron, but there's two hydrogens. And then finally, oxygen has six valence electrons. When I tally all of that up, I get a total of 12 electrons. What are some other rules that I taught you last class? Hydrogen can only ever form one bond. Okay? No exceptions to that. Hydrogen can only ever form one bond. I also told you that carbon, generally speaking, forms four bonds most of the time. Okay, Four bonds. If it has less than four bonds, it's going to have some kind of formal charge. It can't exceed four bonds because it can't exceed an octet. And then oxygen will usually have two bonds, two bonds, and two lone pairs. I'll just abbreviate it LP like that. Now, hydrogen cannot be a central atom. It's impossible because it can only have one bond. And another rule that we looked at during the last class was that the least electronegative element is usually the central atom. So if I look at these three atoms here, and since hydrogen can't be a central atom, well, then it becomes a battle between what's the central atom going to be? Is it carbon or, or oxygen? Well, carbon has an electronegativity of 2.5, and oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Now, if you're saying, well, hey, I don't have all electronegativity values memorized, no problem, because you should memorize the trends in electronegativity. And we said that when we go across a period, let's say if we go from boron to carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine, that electronegativity increases in that direction. Therefore, oxygen is going to be more electronegative than carbon. And so that tells us that carbon should be our central atom. So if we start, you know, putting a bond to carbon and to oxygen, and then we can only have one bond to each hydrogen like that. Well, how many electrons have I used up so far? I've used up one, two, three, four, five, six, right? A pair in each bond. That means I've got six electrons to go. Where am I going to put those electrons? We can see that the carbon doesn't have an octet and the oxygen doesn't have an octet. If you're wondering, you know, what do you, what do you mean by that? What do you mean the, the oxygen doesn't have an octet? Well, the oxygen is surrounded by one, two electrons. That means it needs six more electrons to complete its octet. The carbon is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. That means it needs two more electrons to complete its octet. So how are we going to spread these electrons out? Let's say I take my electrons and I put them all on the oxygen. Put them all on the oxygen like that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now my oxygen has an octet, doesn't it? Okay. Now my carbon does not have an octet. Is there a way I could rectify this? And the answer is yes, absolutely there's a way I could rectify this. If I was to take one of those pairs of electrons and make a bond, Covalent bond, which represents the sharing of electrons. Well, now my oxygen is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
And my carbon is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the carbon and the oxygen both have a complete octet. They're both surrounded by eight electrons. And since hydrogen is in the first period, it needs a duet, right? It needs to have two electrons to be isoelectronic with helium, the closest noble gas. And so this would be the most likely Lewis structure for the compound. Now, resonance structures are defined here. A resonance structure is one of two or maybe more Lewis structures for a single molecule that cannot be represented accurately by only one Lewis structure. If you think about electrons, electrons are really high energy. Electrons, can, if they can move, they will. It's like I told you last time, you know, I like to move it, move it, right? Electrons like to move. So the, the bottom line is this, if electrons can move, they will. If you think of the molecule ozone, so ozone is O3. You know that oxygen, diatomic oxygen, is O2. So that's just molecular oxygen. But ozone has a total of 6 times 3, which is 18 valence electrons. If you draw a Lewis structure for ozone, it might end up looking something like this. And there's nothing wrong with this Lewis structure. This is a perfectly great Lewis structure. You can see the oxygen on the far left hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. It's got an octet. The oxygen in the center is surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. It has an octet. Now it also has a formal charge. How do we calculate that formal charge? Oxygen has six valence electrons. Subtract three sticks, right? One, two, three sticks. Subtract one, two electrons. So 6 minus 3 minus 2 equals plus 1. All right. You see the oxygen on the right has a negative charge. How do we know that? The oxygen has 6 valence electrons. Subtract 1 stick or 1 bond. Subtract 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 electrons. That gives us negative 1. So our formal charges are perfect. And all of the three oxygens in there, they all have an octet. But what about the electron on that Elect, or sorry, on that oxygen atom on the far right. Those electrons can actually move, okay? Those electrons, and when I put a curved arrow, I'm representing the flow of two electrons. They could form a bond here. Now, I can't just, I can't draw something that looks like this. I'll just draw it, don't write this down, okay? This is Mr. Dion being bad, okay? You should never do this, right? There's a major, major problem with this Lewis structure here. And I'll tell you what it is. Again, don't write it down because it's wrong. Okay. The problem is that oxygen is surrounded by 10 electrons. It can't exceed an octet. And so that would be a big no-no. All right. So if I'm going to draw that curved black arrow like I just did, okay, well, that means that I'm going to have to draw another curve and we're going to break one of these bonds and put that pair of electrons over here. So the second arrow, this one here, the pair of electrons from that double bond went over here. And this pair of electrons here ended up to form a new double bond. Now, if you compare these two structures, these are resonance structures, right? We can't accurately represent the ozone molecule with one Lewis structure. You'd say, well, why can't I? You just told me that this is okay. It is okay. There's nothing wrong with the Lewis structure, but it doesn't perfectly most accurately represent the molecule itself because if electrons can move, they will. If you're like, well, is it vibrating in between these two? No, it is not vibrating in between these two. These two resonance structures, overall, when you look at the two of them, um, they both represent the, the actual Lewis structure of the compound. But since the Lewis structure cannot be accurately represented by a single structure, we use a, co a collection of two or more Lewis structures um, that we call resonance structures. So this double-headed arrow that you see here, okay, a double-headed arrow, that is called a resonance arrow. Resonance arrow. When you see an arrow that goes forward and backward like this, this is for equilibrium. Equilibrium. This is not a resonance arrow. Okay, that is something completely different. That is not what we're talking about at all this evening. If you want to go one better, and if you're the kind of student who likes to look around the internet and maybe Google things and look up everything that we do in the class, you might see that oftentimes, or more correctly, I would say,
structures are drawn in, inside square brackets like this. So all the Lewis structures are in there like that. Okay, so the actual ozone molecule is in reality, okay, now pay attention, in reality, it's a hybrid of these two. It's a hybrid of those two structures. It's not this one one minute and this one the next. These two structures, when we look at them together, they give us an accurate representation of the ozone molecule. Okay. Now, there's lots of different illustrations that you know chemistry teachers use to explain resonance structures. One that I've heard many times, which I think is not a bad one, is let's say you have a, a blue horse. Okay, let's say you have a blue horse. Let me see, there isn't a pen. Uh, I'll use blue. Let's say you have a blue horse, blue horse, and a red donkey. Okay, a red donkey. Well, a horse and a donkey can mate. Okay, they can mate. Uh, darn it, I don't have purple. How do I get purple? Is it here? All right, so say they mate, they, they, they will make a purple, a purple mule. Okay, now a mule is a seedless fruit, just like. You cross a monocot and a dicot in biology class. Anyhow, I'm sure some of you have learned about that before. Anyhow, you cross a blue horse and a red donkey, you get a mule that's purple, let's say, okay? Now, a mule is the offspring of a horse and a donkey. It's not a horse one minute and a donkey the next. You look at that purple mule, it's not going to be blue one minute and red the next. No, it's a hybrid of the two. Another example would be, what's another example they use sometimes? Is a nectarine. So a nectarine is a hybrid of a peach and a plum. Right, it kind of has the shape and it sort of has the appearance of a peach, but if you feel the skin of a nectarine, it's got more the, the feel of the skin of a plum. Right? It doesn't have the fuzz on it or whatever. Anyhow, if you're like, what are you talking about, donkeys and plums? Okay. Anyhow, these are just different illustrations that scientists use to explain to students what resonance structures are. Okay, well, with that in mind, um, Next question says, draw three resonance structures for the molecule nitrous oxide, N2O. Um, the atomic arrangement is NNO. So they're telling us that, you know, the atoms are bound together N, N, O, like that. Okay, so we know that much. All right. And then it says, indicate the formal charges, rank the structures in their relative importance to the overall properties of the molecule. Well, first thing we should do is tally up the total number of electrons. Nitrogen has five valence electrons because it's in group 5A. There's two of those plus six electrons from the oxygen. That gives us a total of 16 electrons. All right, let's put some structures together. We'll do them down here on the bottom. If I put a nitrogen and a nitrogen and an oxygen like this. So far, I've only used up four electrons. We got 12 to go. So let's start putting them around. Uh, let's see. We could put... You know, since oxygen is the most electronegative, I could put six electrons there. So that's six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now I have 16 left. Sorry, uh, six left. So if I put um, one, two, three, four, five, six, like this, and I'm just trying to find ways to give everybody an octet. Now let's check here. Every one of these atoms should have an octet. Let's look at the nitrogen on the far left. It's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. Look at the nitrogen in the middle. It's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's good. Let's look at the oxygen. It's surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, everybody's got an octet. I'll just throw this out there to my students. You guys have got enough experience with this by now. Could anybody identify which one of these atoms, if there's any or maybe more than one, would have a formal charge on it? Is there a formal charge on any of these? Not a loaded question. Yeah, Trevor says oxygen has a formal charge. Let's calculate it. Let's just do it in our mind. Oxygen has six valence electrons minus one stick and six dots. So that means the oxygen is going to have a formal charge of negative one. Any other formal charges? Remember, it's N2O, and it's there's no charge, right? So Julius says the nitrogen. Which one, Julius? In the middle, thanks. Okay, so the nitrogen in the middle. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, subtract four, six, zero dots. There we go, positive. And this nitrogen here has, you know, five, subtract three, six, two dots, good, zero. 
there we go. So there's nothing wrong with this structure. This is a perfectly legitimate Lewis structure. But what do we know? We know that electrons like to move. And if they can move, they will. What if I took a pair of these electrons? What if I took these electrons and made a double bond here? Okay, well, that would give the nitrogen in the middle 10 electrons, and that can't happen, okay? So I'd have to break a bond. And if I broke one of these bonds and put a pair of electrons over here, well, I'm going to use square brackets for my, for my resonance structures, and I'm going to draw a resonance arrow. Now I'll put those three atoms together, nitrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. I've made a new bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen. My oxygen still has two bonds, two lone pairs. Now I'm going to have only two bonds in between the nitrogens. And the nitrogen on the far left is going to have one, two, three, four electrons around it like this. Are there any formal charges here? Oh, hot diggity dog there are. Could anybody identify even one of them? Are there any formal charges here anywhere? Nitrogen on the left. Yes, Trevor, I agree. The nitrogen on the left is surrounded by four dots and two sticks, and nitrogen only has five valence electrons, therefore it's got a minus one charge. The nitrogen in the middle has a positive one charge. Notice the plus and the negative cancel each other out, so we still have a perfectly legitimate Lewis structure. If you look, and promise me, I'm not going to do it, but or I promise you, sorry, that all three of these atoms are surrounded by eight electrons. Well, there's one more resonance structure that we could draw. And if you're wondering, you know, like, how would I get all these? The answer is practice, right? You're going to have to practice your Lewis structure. There's one more Lewis structure that I could draw here. Okay? If I was to make a triple bond here, like that, and if I was to put another pair of electrons out on this nitrogen, I get a third resonance structure. Let's draw it. I'm going to do it really quickly here. You end up with a nitrogen with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Then we have this nitrogen that's going to have a triple bond like this. And then I have, there we go. So I'm going to have a two minus charge here. I'm going to have a plus one and a plus one here. Okay, so these are the three possible resonance structures of nitrous oxide. If I evaluate all three of these Lewis structures, let's back up to the first slide that we looked at this evening. Okay, for neutral molecules, the best Lewis structure is the one in which there's no formal charges present. There's no Lewis structures that we came up with that didn't have any formal charges. So let's move to the next one. Lewis structures with large formal charges are less plausible than those with small. Let's go back to our answers. We look at the last one. It's got large charges, right? It's got this two minus charge. And so this is the least, this is going to be the least plausible out of all of them. Now, if I want to compare these two here, they both have the same number of formal charges with the same magnitude. Which one of these would be the most plausible Lewis, uh, Lewis structure? Would it be the one in purple or the one in black? If you go back to that first slide we looked at this evening, it says here, among the Lewis structures having similar distributions of formal charges, the most plausible structure is the one with the negative formal charge on the most electronegative atom which would be oxygen. And so if I go back to my answer, the most plausible Lewis structure here is going to be this guy, most plausible. There we go. So now we've drawn all of the three resonance structures, and we've indicated their relative importance to the overall properties of the molecule. Again, none of these three are a perfect representation of nitrous oxide, right? The three of the actual nitrous oxide structure is going to be a hybrid of these three, but it's going to resemble this one more than this one here, and the other one is going to be somewhere in the middle. All right, let's look at some exceptions to the octet rule. I focused a lot on the octet rule in um, during the last lecture and a little bit this evening. The exceptions to the octet rule can kind of be summed up in three possibilities, okay? The first one is the incomplete octet. So let me just list them here, okay? So exceptions are incomplete, incomplete octet, that's one. Um, the second one is an odd number of electrons, odd number of electrons. And the third would, would be um, 
and exceeding the octet rule. So exceeding, exceed, and octet. So those are the three possibilities for exceptions to the octet rule. You're responsible for, for knowing these exceptions for the octet rule. And if you're like, oh man, more exceptions. Well, these exceptions are so common that uh, they, they are really common. And that, you know, I'm not, it's, um, on the next exam, you're going to see them for sure. At least one of them, okay? The first two are the incomplete octet. So if you look at element number four on the periodic table, it's beryllium. Okay, it's, it's an alkaline earth. It's in group 2A metal. And beryllium only has two valence electrons, right? If you look at the electron configuration of beryllium, it's helium 2s2. And so it's only got two valence electrons. If you were to draw the Lewis structure of beryllium, it would be Be with two electrons like that. And so it can only form two bonds. Okay, so we'll put here beryllium only forms two bonds like that. And it forms covalent bonds. They're not metallic bonds. If you go down to magnesium, you start forming, or sorry, ionic bonds. So beryllium forms two bonds and they're covalent bonds. So we'll put here covalent as well. An example would be beryllium hydride, this molecule here. Since beryllium has two valence electrons and hydrogen has one valence electron, the Lewis structure of beryllium hydride would look like this. If we move to group 3A, so this is group, group 2A. If we would just actually just beryllium, but beryllium is in group 2A. If we move to group 3A, there's two exceptions you need to be concerned with, boron, boron, and aluminum. If you look at their Lewis structures, boron has three valence electrons, aluminum has three valence electrons. They only, only form three bonds. Okay, so since fluorine is um, in, uh, a halogen, has seven valence electrons, can form one bond, right? It's one of the rules we looked at during the last lecture. If I have boron trifluoride, BF3, it's going to be boron in the center with three bonds to fluorine, like that. Another example would, you know, some, if you're like, what about aluminum? You mentioned aluminum. If you had like AlCl3, aluminum uh, chloride, since aluminum has three valence electrons, it would be similar. You'd have aluminum with three chlorines surrounding it, like that. Okay, so there's two more examples or two more exceptions that you need to be aware of. The next one is an odd number of electrons. We don't look at a whole lot of examples of this. In fact, I even looked at the textbook this, this afternoon to be like, what does he say about um, unpaired electrons? So when you have an odd number of electrons in a molecule, an unpaired electron, I'll write it down here, unpaired, an unpaired electron is called a radical. It's called a radical. So this is a radical here where you have an unpaired electron. So if you have Nitrogen monoxide, we tally up the total number of electrons. It's 11 electrons. And you see that you have an unpaired electron on the nitrogen. Another example would be NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which has a total of five plus 12. So that has 17 electrons. I'll just draw the Lewis structure of NO2 for you quickly. And it looks something like this. Okay, it looks like this where we have an unpaired electron on the nitrogen so it's going to have a positive charge right and the oxygen is going to have a negative charge but i'm telling you right now that that guy is so reactive that if it comes around another molecule of no2 and this is in our textbook he mentions it okay um that these two electrons okay meaning this electron and this electron will form a bond and you'll end up forming Nitrogen tetraoxide, so that everybody will have an octet. Okay. There we go. We have all of our formal charges. Anyhow, that will happen spontaneously. Again, these are probably, literally, you guys, the only examples I would ask would be NO and NO2. The next one is the expanded octet. Now, this is probably, this is the one we're going to see the most. Okay, this is the, the granddaddy of them all, is the expanded octet. And that happens when we have a central atom with a principal quantum number greater than two. What does that mean? It means the elements from the third period and beyond. Okay, if you think about the octet rule, and you can research this on your own if you don't 
believe me, dude, if you actually look at the octet rule, something we talk about a lot in this class, if you ever took high school chemistry, I'm sure they brought up the octet rule. The octet rule only applies to a few elements on the entire periodic table. Okay? It applies to like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine, uh, you know, and a few others. Okay? Preceding those elements, we have exceptions like beryllium and boron, right? And then following those, once you get to the third period and beyond, we can expand an octet. And if you're wondering, like, how the heck does that happen? Why does sulfur, why is sulfur here and sulfur hexafluoride? Why is it surrounded by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? Why is it surrounded by 12 electrons instead of eight? Well, the reason why is because sulfur is in the third period and it has the three D orbitals available to it. And so it's able to expand its octet. Now that's the best answer I can give you at the level of our course, but we're going to see many examples of that. So again, if you had to draw this molecule of sulfur hexafluoride, you tally up all the electrons and you got 48 electrons. I told you last lecture that fluorine can only ever have one bond and three lone pairs like that. So that means this is the only possible way to arrange this molecule and the sulfur has an expanded octet, right? It's surrounded by a total of 12 electrons. And we'll look at some examples of that tonight as well. Well, that's enough talking. I think it's time for us to try a few problems where we're going to get to apply some of these concepts. Let's take a look at this one. It says draw a Lewis structure for aluminum triiodide. So Ali3. Let's tally up the total number of electrons. Aluminum has three electrons. Iodine is a halogen. It's got seven valence electrons. There's three of those. That's 21 plus three. That equals 24 total electrons. What did I tell you about aluminum? Aluminum is one of those exceptions to the octet rule. Aluminum only forms four bonds because it's got three valence electrons. So that means that my aluminum is going to have one, two, three bonds like that. And since iodine is a halogen, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven valence electrons. All right? Remember that I told you that the halogens almost always have one bond and three lone pairs, okay? Now, in this bond here, where did the other electron come from? It's gonna come from the aluminum. So I can put, pl place my iodides around like this and I can fill up their octets because they have to have an octet. They're not one of the exceptions I looked at. And this is my Lewis structure for aluminum triiodide. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on this one, at least the rationale. All right, well, how about I throw a question at you that, you know, isn't in the notes then, okay? I want you to try, try this yourself. I'll give you a second. Try, try beryllium fluoride. I want you to draw BEF2, the Lewis structure for BEF2. I'm going to set a timer there. I'll give you 60 seconds to try it. Hey, Siri. Hey, Siri. Set a timer for 50 seconds. Okay, what did we know about beryllium? Beryllium is in group 2A, and I told you that beryllium is an exception. It's got two valence electrons, and it forms two bonds only, two covalent bonds. I also told you that fluorine always forms one bond and has three, pick those up, three lone pairs. So the only possible way to put these together is to have my beryllium in the center with two bonds to my fluorines. Like this. Give me a thumbs up if you got that one correct. Beryllium fluoride, BEF2. All right. 
All right. Well, let's give another one a shot here. Let's try this one. It says, draw the Lewis structure for phosphorus pentafluoride in which all five atoms are bonded to the central phosphorus atom. So we're going to draw phosphorus pentafluoride. I'm going to give you a few seconds to think. All right, well, let's tally up the total number of electrons in phosphorus pentafluoride. Phosphorus is in group 5A. It's got five valence electrons. Fluorine has seven valence electrons. It's a halogen times five. That's 35 plus five gives me 40 electrons. It tells us here that all five fluorine atoms are going to be bonded to the central phosphorus. I put my phosphorus in the center. One, two, three, four, five. Remember that fluorine always has one bond and three lone pairs. OK, have I used up all 40 electrons? The answer is yes. If you look at just one of these fluorine atoms, it's surrounded by three, elect three lone pairs. So that's six electrons plus two in the bond. Six plus two is eight. And then I have one, two, three, four, five. 8 times 5 is 40 electrons. And so this is the correct Lewis structure for phosphorus pentafluoride. What do you notice? That phosphorus has an expanded, expanded octet. Why can it do that? Because phosphorus is in the third period. He is in third period. All right. Let's try another one. This here, draw a Lewis structure for the sulfate ion in which all four oxygen atoms are bonded to the central sulfur atom. What's a sulfate ion? Everybody should know that by now. It's SO4 2 minus. Sulfur has six valence electrons. It's in group 6A. Oxygen has six valence electrons. It's also in group 6A. There's four of those. And I have to add two extra electrons because I have a two negative charge. So that gives me 24 plus 8. I tally that up. That's 32 valence electrons like that. It's telling me that I'm going to have my sulfur in the center, and it's surrounded by 1, 2, 3, 4 oxygen. 1, 2, 3, 4 oxygen. I've also got a 2 minus charge. Remember that the most preferable Lewis structure is going to be one where the negative charge is going to be on the most electronegative atom. The most electronegative atom in the periodic table is fluorine, but second place, the silver metal, goes to oxygen. We saw several times this evening that when oxygen has a negative charge, it's when it's got one bond and three lone pairs, right? Six valence electrons subtract six dots and one stick, negative one. So I've got a negative one on this oxygen. If I do the same thing here, I have a negative one charge here. How many electrons have I used up? Well, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. That means I've got 12 left to go. Where am I going to put them? Well, if I've already gotten rid of my negative charges and I've got two of them, you probably remember the other rule that when oxygen is neutral, it's got two bonds and two lone pairs. Two bonds and two lone pairs, like this. There's nothing wrong with this Lewis structure at all. Okay? In fact, this is the best Lewis structure that you can come up with for the sulfate ion. Now, if you drew something like this, and I've seen students do this where they have all single bonds to the oxygens. Okay? If you were to draw this, technically, this is okay. okay? If I put you know, negative charge here, negative charge here, negative charge here. What's the formal charge of my sulfur going to be? Six minus four sticks and zero dots. That's plus two. So that means that I have to put a plus two charge on my sulfur. 
If I have plus two and four minus, that still gives me two minus. So there's nothing wrong with this. This is a legitimate Lewis structure. Okay, it's not an illegitimate Lewis structure. The problem is the formal charges are not minimized. And so this is going to be the major, the most plausible Lewis vector for the sulfate ion. Question 9.12, draw a Lewis structure of the noble gas compound xenon tetrafluoride, xenon tetrafluoride, in which all fluorine atoms are bonded to the central xenon atom. Let's tally up the total number of electrons first. I've got xenon tetrafluoride. Xenon is a noble gas. Noble gases have eight valence electrons. Fluorine is a halogen. Halogens have seven valence electrons. So that's 28 plus eight. That gives me a total of 36 valence electrons. We know that our xenon is going to be in the center and it's going to have four bonds to fluorine. Okay, I'm going to give you a second to see if you can finish up this Lewis structure. Okay, my question to you guys is this. Are there going to be any lone pairs of electrons on the xenon? Yes or no? When I complete this Lewis structure, will there be lone pairs on the xenon? Julia says yes. You're absolutely correct, Julia, right? If I look at the structure that I've drawn so far, I need to use up 36 electrons. I've got two, four, six, eight. Got a long ways to go. I get 28 electrons to use. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Now I've used up 24 plus eight. That's 32 electrons. That means I've got 36 minus 30, 32 electrons. That means I've got four electrons left over. Where are they going to go? They can't go on the fluorines because, as I told you, fluorine always has one bond and three lone pairs. So that means the four electrons remaining, I'm going to have one, two, three, four unpaired electrons on the xenon. Xenon is in the fifth period. That means it can have an expanded octet. <laughs> All right. Nothing wrong with that Lewis structure. Perfectly. <coughs> <coughs> Perfectly reasonable. All right, let's switch gears and get into the very last section of this chapter, which deals with bond enthalpies. We spent some time talking about enthalpies earlier on in our thermodynamics section, but now we're going to talk about bond enthalpies. And what a bond enthalpy is, it says the enthalpy change required to break a particular bond in one mole of gaseous molecules is referred to as the bond enthalpy. I've got a bunch of beautiful examples here. We'll start with the first one. 
If we have hydrogen gas, right? The hydrogen gas that was in the Hindenburg that made it blow up. If you want to break apart one mole of gaseous H2 molecules, that means you want to break all those H2 bonds, okay? Avogadro's number of them. It's going to cost you some energy, isn't it, right? You got to uh, rip those molecules apart. It's going to cost you 436.4 kilojoules. Well, you can see that Cl2 is actually a less stable molecule. How can you say that? Well, the reason I can say it is because if I want to rip apart one mole or Avogadro's number of Cl2 molecules in the gaseous phase, it takes a lot less energy, right? So they're just not as stable. Okay, if it takes me less energy, it takes almost half the amount of energy to rip those apart. What about HCl? That's a diatomic molecule. It's got one hydrogen, one chlorine. If I want to break that HCl, we could draw the Lewis structure of it. Right, what we're doing here is we're talking about breaking this bond. Right, with the Cl2, we were talking about the Lewis structure of Cl2 is this. We're talking about breaking this bond. If I go to H2, right, there's the Lewis structure of H2. I'm talking about breaking this bond, right? Same rationale. If I want to break that bond between hydrogen and chlorine, it costs me 431.9 kilojoules. Okay, so it costs some energy to break bonds, doesn't it? If you look at the amount of energy required to break oxygen and nitrogen, the Lewis structures are shown here. Well, oxygen's got a double bond. That's going to cost serious energy, right? Almost 500 kilojoules. But you notice that when you get to nitrogen, wow, that's like the big one, right? Over 900 kilojoules. Why? Because if you look at the Lewis structure of nitrogen, N2 is held together by a triple bond. What's the overall conclusion that we can draw here? Is that when it comes to the amount of energy that it takes to break bonds or the bond enthalpies, okay, when we go from a single bond to a double bond to a triple bond, the bond enthalpies get bigger and bigger and bigger. It costs more and more energy, right? A bond is a result of or orbital overlap, and the more orbital overlap we have, the harder it gets to pull atoms apart from each other, okay? This is a trend that all general chemistry students have to know. Go. Triple bond is going to be the strongest, double bond is weaker, and then a single bond is the weakest. Now, if we look up bond enthalpies in polyatomic molecules, let me just go back to these examples right here. Okay? If I have a bond between hydrogen and hydrogen, this is a diatomic molecule. Or sorry, this is a monatomic molecule. But anyhow, it's the only possibility, right, is HH. The only possibility for Cl2 is Cl and Cl. The only possibility for HCl is H and Cl. The only possibility for these two are these numbers, right? There's no other possible ways to combine one hydrogen and one chlorine or one hydrogen and one hydrogen, right? So these bond enthalpies are hard and fast numbers. Now, if I look at, let's say, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, and that's where I was going on the next slide. Where do I find oxygen-hydrogen bonds? Well, jeepers, I find them in water. Right here's water. There's an oxygen hydrogen bond here. If I draw ethanol, the alcohol that's found in you know vodka and beer, that's got an OH in it. If I look at hydrogen peroxide, this is the Lewis structure of hydrogen peroxide. It's got an OH one. I can tell you right now that the bond enthalpies of the oxygen hydrogen bond in here in water versus ethanol versus Hydrogen peroxide, they're all different. They're all in the same neighborhood, but they're all different. Why? Because they're all in different electronic environments, right? They're all in different molecules, so they're going to be a little bit different. Let me show you an example. If you break apart water, okay? Now, if we look at the structure of water, H2O, okay? If I break a bond, first bond between hydrogen and oxygen, it's got a bond enthalpy of 502 kilojoules. But if I take OH, what's left over? I guess I should draw it like this. If I take the oxygen hydrogen bond in the gaseous phase and I break that apart, it costs close to the same, but it's less. It's 427 kilojoules. And so the average bond enthalpy of those two is 464 kilojoules. So if I go to a table of average bond enthalpies in um, diatomic molecules, in polyatomic molecules, let's see what it looks like. Now, I have it blown up on the next sheet. I thought I had. Now, we'll try to read it the best we can. It's a little fuzzy, and I apologize for that. But if you look at this table very carefully, you see all the ones that are highlighted in red? 
okay? These are diatomic molecules, carbon monoxide, HF, HCl, HBr, HI, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, ClF, Br, Br, II, right? These are all diatomic molecules. Those are all molecules, everything that I have, you know, signified here in red. Everything else, all of these other bond enthalpies, okay, everything else, I'm not going to highlight them all here, everything else, all of these bonds could come from many different molecules, okay? A carbon-carbon triple bond, for example, there's Avogadro's number of molecules that have carbon-carbon triple bonds. And so, if you look at the molecules that are highlighted in red, you can see that their bond enthalpies are listed to the tenths place, right? Or to, um, uh, Yes, to the tenths place. They're all listed to one decimal place. Whereas all the others are all listed to the ones place. Why is that? Because the ones that are in black, those are all average bond enthalpies. Whereas the ones that are in red, those are hard and fast numbers because they're the only possibilities okay, for those particular bonds. Right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that explanation. I'm probably over explaining it. But sometimes that's a good thing. Okay, cool. All right. Now, obviously, I don't expect you to memorize a table of bond enthalpies. Okay, do not expect you to memorize that. But what do you notice about the numbers in here? Something that I notice is that all all bond enthalpies. I'll just say BE. All BE values are positive. You notice that there's no negative numbers in here. Okay, all of these numbers are positive, and all of these numbers are positive. Why? Because it takes energy to break a bond. Nothing more than that. If it takes energy, right, that means you got to put energy in. So the bond enthalpy, bond enthalpies are all positive. Now you're thinking like, yeah, that's great, cool, happy for you. Okay, well, what could we do with those bond enthalpies? And the answer is we can calculate the delta H of a reaction. Ah. This goes all the way back to chapter six, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, we can calculate the delta H of a reaction using bond enthalpy. Back in chapter six, we did calculate um, the enthalpy of a reaction, right? But we said that the delta H of a reaction in chapter six, in order to do that, we used heats of formation. We said the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient times the Delta H of formation of products, okay, minus the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient multiplied by the delta H F of the reactants. Okay, that's something that we looked at in chapter chapter six. But in chapter six, we were looking at delta H of formation. When you have a heat of formation, you're forming a bond. Heat is released, and that is why. We did the calculation as products minus reactants. Since bond enthalpies are positive values, not negative values, the way that we calculate delta H of a reaction using bond energies is the following. You imagine that first we have to break all the bonds in all the reactants, just boop, 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 break them all. So we have to put energy in, right? And then when we form bonds, energy is going to be released. So how are we going to calculate that? The delta H of our reaction is going to be to equal to the sum of all the bond energies of the reactants minus the bond energies of the products. This is the only equation that we use in general chemistry where it's reactants minus products. Now I want you to think about why again. Okay, there's a good rationale for it. Remember the delta HF, those were negative values, right? That's energy being released when you form something. Whereas now we're talking about breaking the bonds instead of forming it. So we're basically flipping it around. Okay, now this is an equation you're going to have to know for the next exam. Now, if you think about what it's saying here in this statement, okay, imagine the reaction proceeding by breaking all the bonds in the reactant. So if we have this scenario here on the left, enthalpy is on this scale here. We start out with some reactants, okay? They have bonds in them. We're gonna have to break apart all those bonds, aren't we? Right, we're gonna separate them all into their atoms. 
that's going to cost some energy, right? That's going to be a positive amount of energy, right? Because we have to put energy to break them. But when we form bonds, when those after those atoms are formed and we make new molecules, when we make new bonds, energy is going to be released. Now, if we put a whole crap load of energy in, but only a little bit of energy is released, that means we put in more energy than we got out. Right? And so that's going to be an endothermic process. Look, another way of writing it would be, or another way of saying it would be this. The delta H of the reaction is going to be the sum of the bond energy of the reactants. And I'm just rewriting the equation. Minus the sum of the bond energy of the product. Look at the amount of bond energy we put in. The amount of bond energy associated with our reactants, right, right here, is a big number. It took us a lot of energy, you know, to break those bonds, but we only released a little amount of energy. If you take a big number and you subtract a small number, you get a delta H that is positive, right? That's endothermic. The converse is if you start with reactant molecules that are higher in energy, it's going to take less energy to break them apart, right? And when you form your new molecules, more energy is going to be released. If we look at this exact same equation, oh my God, I didn't mean to paste all that, did I? Here we go. Anyhow, we're going to have our delta H over here is being a small number. And we're going to be subtracting a big number when we release all that energy. What does that mean? It means our delta H is going to be a negative, and that's going to be exothermic. OK, so it's just a different way of calculating the change in enthalpy of a reaction, just using bond enthalpies instead of heats of formation like we did in chapter six. In organic chemistry, this is something we do all the time because there's like literally Avogadro's number of molecules of carbon, carbon, single bonds and double bonds and triple bonds and oxygen, hydrogen bonds and all these different things. Now, in the interest of time, I just want to go over this slide with you quickly and then we'll have to call it quits for the evening. But I want to talk about what the heck is going on in these two reactions. Let's look at the one on the left first. It says H2 plus Cl2 gives you 2HCl. Well, if you examine what's really going on here, you've got an H2 molecule. What's an H2 molecule look like? Well, here's the Lewis structure of H2. Here's the Lewis structure of Cl2. Here's the Lewis structure of HCl. HCl, HCl. This is why it's good to have your Lewis structures mastered. In order to do this reaction, look, I've got a hydrogen hydrogen bond here and I've got a chlorine chlorine bond here. Do you see any hydrogen hydrogen bonds or any chlorine chlorine bonds over here? Because I sure don't. So that means that you had to break both of those bonds. You've got to break this one and this one. There's an energy cost associated with breaking those bonds, right? Breaking the H2 and the Cl2 bond. But then you're going to form two new bonds. What are the new bonds? You form two new HCl bonds. Right, so energy, energy in, that's breaking, breaking, and energy out. That's when you form the bonds, energy is going to be released, forming, forming, whatever, like that. Okay, let's look at another example, and this is the exact same thing. It's just, you know, kind of drive the point home. Here you've got a balanced equation, you get two molecules of H2, so that's two H2 molecules. Molecule O2 has a double bond, each oxygen has a pair of electrons, two pairs of electrons. Then we get two H2O molecules. Okay, this is a great example. Now, if you're asleep and if you're tired and you're like, I got to drive through the lab, pay attention just for a second, okay? On the left, I've got two HH bonds. Do you see any HH bonds over here? Because I sure don't. I see bonds to hydrogen, but they're oxygen hydrogen bonds. Over here, I've got an oxygen oxygen double bond that doesn't exist over here. So that means I've got to break this bond. I got to break this bond. I got to break that bond. But then when I form my product, I release some beautiful energy, right? I release energy. 
I get the negative of the bond enthalpy of an oxygen hydrogen one, two, three, four times. Okay, give me a thumbs up if that clears up the idea a little bit. Again, what we're talking about is that the delta H of the reaction is going to be equal to the sum of the bond energies, bond enthalpies of the reactants minus the bond enthalpies of the products. Think about it. If all of these values are positive, you're putting in positive values here, and you're subtracting positive values here. Okay? So, if it's an exothermic reaction, positive minus, you have, uh, um, if it's an endothermic reaction, you have big minus small, gives you positive. If you have an exothermic reaction, you have small minus big. And there we go. That's my best I can do to explain bond enthalpy to you. All right, so the literally the last two things that we have to look over in this, um, in this chapter, our two practice problems. So problem 9.13, kind of move my things over to the side here, didn't I? Anyhow, problem 9.13 is equation 9.3. So equation 9.3 is this guy right here. This is, uh, let's see here, equation 9.3. And then um, it says use that equation. And of course, you'd have to use the table of bond enthalpies. Compare the result that you get with uh, equation 6.18 and calculate the enthalpy um, of reaction for the process shown here. So equation 9.3, you're going to use the bond enthalpies to calculate the delta H of this reaction. Then equation 6.18, that's the one where you use the heats of formation, and you're going to compare the two. Okay, and you do a similar exercise here. It says estimate the enthalpy change for the combustion of hydrogen gas. If you're estimating it, that means you're going to use bond enthalpies, right? Because bond enthalpies are going to be estimations of the value of the um, bond enthalpy of the oxygen hydrogen bond in water instead of using heats of formation. All right. And the solutions to both of these are found at the end of chapter nine in your textbook.